Hey everyone and welcome back for a Tuesday edition of Lunch Break Live with me, Ivana. And today I've got a really cool episode coming and it's cool for me because I am joined by our own Roy Johnson and I have worked with Roy for about five years now and uh, we've been colleagues and friends for a while and me, like so many other people, I think were very surprised when Roy made an appearance on Sunday night on our TVs on the ESPN docuseries The Last Dance. Roy had uh, Roy kept this one to himself for sure. <laughs> so uh, today Roy is joining me to talk about uh, his experience filming that segment for The Last Dance and also about covering Michael Jordan in his prime and covering the NBA and some other stars and uh, big names to you and I that Roy has interviewed and Roy has watched really through the prime of their careers. So if y'all have any questions for Roy about his time covering the league or his, uh, his career, filming The Last Dance, please let us know in the comments here. I will ask him. I'll be keeping an eye on my phone right here. And and uh, Roy, first of all, how uh, how was it to see yourself on TV on Sunday? What was interesting is I really wasn't watching television at the time. I was on the phone with a friend, and all of a sudden, my phone starts to blow up. I'm getting calls from people I don't normally get calls from. I'm getting text messages, and I looked at the clock, and I said, oh, it must be on. <laughs> so, I mean, I've done a lot of interviews through the years, and I've been on some uh, ESPN documentaries before, uh, but this one was a little unique uh, in part because of what we're all going through and, and the thirst that people have for not just live sports, but something that uh, relates to them, something that they are passionate about. And there's very few things that basketball fans are more passionate about than uh, that era, that team, that player, Michael Jordan, and everything that they went through. They were the Beatles of professional sports for almost a decade, and so it was great to to watch that and relive that, uh, apparently with half the world, because the ratings are doing very well. And uh, I loved, you wrote a column about that this morning. We will link it in this video below so anybody can uh, can click on that and read what you wrote about your experience there. But uh, I loved how in the column that you compared them to the Beatles and then you did now because uh, if you haven't seen The Last Dance, you 100% should see it. Um, but it's funny because there's a clip early on in the series about the team going to France and uh, they are flocked with media and with people asking for autographs and following them. And uh, I think that's a really good comparison. Uh, to give to people maybe who aren't as familiar with sports or with that season. So uh, just if you're new to uh, this The Last Dance conversation or if you just logged on our video, The Last Dance is a 10-part docuseries put on by ESPN that chronicles the Chicago Bulls 1997-98 through 98 season. And uh, it's a 10-part series. Not all the parts are out yet. It's coming out every Sunday night. There's two episodes that drop on Sunday night on ESPN. You can watch it the day after on your streaming services that are linked with ESPN. And uh, the first episode that Roy was featured on was episode number five, and that's premiered on Sunday night. So again, this was kind of a surprise for everybody uh, that it hit on Sunday. And Roy had told me before we started this video that he wasn't even sure uh, what part of his interview would make the cut. He wasn't sure what episode he would be featured on. So Roy, tell us a little bit about when you filmed this interview view and um, what you expected to be in or what episode you expected to be in or if you even expected to make the final cut at all. So the interview took place in April of 2019 so over a year ago I was contacted by Jason Heyer. Jason is the director of the series and I had worked with Jason on a documentary that uh, I was a co-executive producer of called Bernie and Ernie which was part of the 30 for 30 series on ESPN so familiar with Jason and his work and he told me about this uh, documentary that they were doing. It was fascinating to me because of how it came forth, and we can talk about that later. Asked me to come to Atlanta and sit down for an interview. And if you've ever been part of things like this, it's such an expansive period of time. They ask you several questions. So the interview went on for several hours. You know, we took some breaks, but he asked just about everything that could have been involved either with Michael Jordan or the NBA during that period. So. I had no idea, A, if I even made the cut, and B, what would be on. I did post about three, four weeks ago when it was starting to be promoted, when Last Dance was starting to be promoted, that, hey, I, I did an interview for this, don't know if I'm in it, uh, but you guys should check it out. And Jason 
uh, actually put in the comments, hey, you made the cut. So that at least I knew I was in the series. Last week, I received a text message from ESPN asking me if I wanted to be identified as Roy S. Johnson or Roy Johnson, of course, Roy S. Johnson. So that's when I at least knew I was in episode five. And as you can see, they were still working on it last week. Uh, many people think that these things are done well in advance. Uh, this one was actually supposed to run in the fall, I believe, to coincide with next season. But instead, after sports was canceled and ESPN needed some program to boost its viewership, uh, they decided to move it up uh, until May. And of course, it's been a big ratings hit. So it was, it was fun to watch it. It was fun to uh, hear from people. It's very humbling. I've been on quite a journey. Uh, some things, I've written some stories that I've even forgotten about. One of the stories that I posted was on the first game when Michael Jordan appeared at Madison Square Garden, six games into his pro season. Uh, as you might imagine, the place was sold out, even though the Knicks that year were not going to be very good. Uh, but it was great to be able to reminisce about being at the Garden for Jordan's first game. That's just, that's wild to me. I know that um, I definitely grew up, as I think most most people did, especially in, in my age range. We grew up on Space Jam and on, um, you know, Michael Jordan kind of having that high in his career. And um, it's just, it's very interesting that you were there and you were a uh, reporting and you were editing and in the business during this time and covering pro sports. Um I am going to put up on the screen here, I'm going to replace my face to show y'all the cover of the magazine um, that Roy was working on at the time and did a, this story called The Jordan Effect. And this is, like I said, this is the cover of that magazine then. Um, it says exactly how many billions has Michael Jordan pumped into the economy. And um, tell us a little bit about this story, Roy, what, how this came to be and what it was like reporting on this. Because I imagine at this time, there was a lot of focus on Michael Jordan as a basketball player. But there probably wasn't as much of a focus on Michael Jordan as a, as, as a moneymaker and as an economy booster. Well, let me give you and viewers a little bit of context. When I began covering the NBA, I was at Sports Illustrated, and the NBA at that time was almost a niche league. Its NBA Finals games were on tape delay, and a lot of people uh, maybe under 50 don't even know what tape delay is, but it means they, they didn't even show them live. They showed them later in the evening because people didn't like the NBA that much. Then along come Bird and Magic and totally transformed the league into a global phenomenon. And then towards the height of their careers, maybe just the other side of the mountain. Here comes this skinny kid from North Carolina uh, who takes the league by storm, uh, however, isn't able to crack the NBA Finals until seven seasons into his pro career. Of course, once he does that, once the, the Bulls beat the Lakers uh, to win his first championship, then the league was really Jordan's. There was a lot of interesting interaction in a personal interaction is the mantle was passed to this young man to this new team that was the most popular team and so by the time this last dance season came along i had moved from sports illustrated to the new york times and was now at fortune magazine so i was looking at a lot of stories including sports through a business lens at this point space jam had been a huge hit michael jordan had really transformed nike into the market leader uh, in sneakers and sports apparel Anything he touched, there were no such things as sports videos other than maybe those goofy workout videos before Michael Jordan started putting out video after video, so he made the video market. So we wanted to take a broad look to see at how he impacted the economy. It was a team of three of us. We talked to economists, we talked to people on Wall Street, uh, we talked to industry leaders, not just to figure out a, a fake number, but a number that really try to apportion a specific amount and what percentage of ticket sales can be attributed to Jordan? What percentage of Space Jam's revenues could be uh, attributed to exactly to Jordan? And through it all, uh, we discovered that he had a $10 billion impact on the economy. And if you're able to read the story, uh, I'll have a link later and I'll post it. Maybe we'll share it. Uh, we really took a calculator and we had every category and we had a number. We kept adding it up as we got to the end of the story. We were stunned that it was $10 billion. And again, this was in 1998. So imagine years later, decades later, how much of an impact because the Jordan brand is still a thriving brand. He is still the owner of an NBA franchise. So uh, his impact is probably 
at least twofold from what it was in 1998. And I'm sure that, you know, everybody can think back, or maybe not everybody, but a lot of people can think back about items that we bought and that contributed, you know, to the reporting that you did in that story. I remember that me and my brother had all the little Space Jam toys and the alien booster guns and those kind of things. And people had the jerseys, the shoes, everything. And uh, it, it's funny how many things that we don't think about maybe on the consumer side that, like you said, just really put in those billions of dollars into the economy. Um, one other thing that you know I, I want to go ahead and ask you is that something I think a lot of people are wondering is a have you met Michael Jordan personally have you interviewed him personally and uh, I know the answer to that is yes and what are your favorite Michael Jordan stories what is your favorite memory of interviewing or meeting Michael Jordan well, certainly when you cover a pro league or if you cover anything, you meet the principals and our job as reporters, no matter what we do, is to be the conduit between the subjects and the public. So I was very fortunate to be part of uh, a great group of sports writers, many of whom are still doing it. People like Michael Wilbon, J.A. Adande, are still in the sports field. Uh, to be a part of this group that were following this league and watched it transform as these young players, Charles Barkley and Sidney Moncrief and others, coupling with Dr. J, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, to transform it into a, uh, a global sport. So yes, I uh, met Michael Jordan several times, post-game interviews, uh, interviews at practices, etc. Et but my favorite Michael Jordan story really has nothing to do with basketball, or at least not on a court. I saw many great plays and was a witness to many uh, phenomenal moments. But this was in his second season. And in October of his second season, he broke a bone in his foot caused him to miss several games. Of course, everyone wanted to be careful with him coming back. Uh, but like many great athletes, he was antsy to get back. So he took control of his rehab and really uh, accelerated the process. And without the knowledge of his agent or the Bulls, he flew down to North Carolina, worked out, and one day in February, played two hours of pickup basketball. He comes back to Chicago, uh, takes a stress test from the team doctor and decide that he passes the stress test, the strength test, and the doctor gives him the go ahead. So I'm in New York for the New York Times. My boss says, well, why don't you fly to Chicago and go talk to Michael? Michael's decided to come back against the wishes of his team, against the wishes of his agent. So I fly to Chicago, get off the plane, go to the practice facility. There's nobody there but Jordan. So Jordan and I sit in the corner of this empty gym and had an extensive conversation about his decision to come back, why he was coming back, what happened in North Carolina. And of course, that was before he became Michael Jordan, before he became a global icon. But I often think back to that moment and having that opportunity to share an intimate conversation with somebody who would belong to the world in just a few years on the occasions when we would run into each other uh, after that, especially after he retired and after I had moved out of sports. We would just kind of glance at each other and smile, say, do you remember that moment in the corner of the gym? And we would just look at each other and say, yeah, that was a long time ago. And I have to ask, on what occasions do you just run into Michael Jordan? Or where do you just run into Michael Jordan? Because I want to go there. I want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was, this was when I was still attending sports events. If you go to the finals, uh, you would often see him there. Or if you were an occasion where there was a sports event and he would happen to be involved. So, yes, it was when I was still covering sports and being around uh, teams and leagues, particularly around the NBA Finals, when most of the league's owners, uh, coaches, and other uh, executives come into town for, for those games. So when I was attending NBA Finals, it was not uh, unusual to run into uh, a, a, a Mike Johnson or Charles Barkley or anyone who's still involved in the sport around the team hotel, uh, around the pool sometimes. Of course, there's a lot more security, but I've been around quite a bit and uh, pretty much have been able to, to access some of the places that a lot of people have not been able to. Well, and I'm going to embarrass you for a second, and ha I have to show everybody this picture of you interviewing Magic Johnson. And I know that, that you sent this to me and we laugh, but my first, my first thought was that he looks 
so small and so young compared to what he does now. And we all do. We right, both do. <laughs> right, understandably so. Um, but you know, it, this just kind of shows some of the people that you have gotten to interview in in your career, and um, that is something that a lot of people can't say. So, what is one of your favorite memories? It doesn't have to be Michael Jordan, but covering the NBA and covering some of these legends. We've got Magic Johnson here. Um, you've got one as well of Dr. Dre. I'll throw that up in just a second. But you know, what is your um, like I said? What is Dr. your favorite? Dr. J. Memory? Dr. Dre is the uh, the artist. The doc, is Dr. J. I'm sorry. Uh, this is before my time, Roy. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. What is you know the the all of these different legends? Who was your favorite, and and well, what was your favorite to interview? Those might be uh, different answers. Yeah, of course, uh, it's it's always difficult to pick between one, and I'm not going to to do that because I had so many great moments. Not just covering the NBA, spent many years covering professional tennis, so was really uh, blessed to be able to get to know Arthur Ashe, who's probably one of the sports figures that I most admire. Uh, those of you who don't know, of course, he was the uh, he won Wimbledon, was the first African American male to win Wimbledon, was a tennis star, but also. Uh, leveraged his talents to help change the world, was a, an advocate against apartheid, and really got to know him in the last few years of his life uh, as he was captain of the Davis Cup team. But one of my fun memories is with uh, involves a Martina Navratilova, of course, another great tennis champion. And uh, as she was studying to become a U.S. citizen, she asked me to help her practice, to help her study for her citizenship test the next day. So it's moments like that uh, that I remember. John McEnroe and I were at Stanford at the same time. He was a freshman when I was a senior. So of course, through his career, we often had some nice side conversations uh, as he was you know, having, doing his antics on the tennis court, but also being a great champion. One of the moments I remember, we were on a cross country flight and John was a little high strung. And this was right around the time when tennis was transitioning from wooden rackets to uh, graphite and metal. And John, I was in coach, of course, he was in first class, but he stood by my seat pretty much the entire flight and complained about the changes in tennis and how it was going to change tennis. I felt like I was giving him a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, I said, can you at least bring me a drink from first class if you're going to stand over my seat for but four really? <laughs> hours and talk about the change of tennis? Uh, <gasps> and I recall uh, Steffi Graf uh, asking me to help her prepare for her speech. I mean, she was 18 years old when she became number one and had to give a speech at the banquet uh, that, that where the number one players in the world are recognized, she was still a kid. And of course she was from another country, she's from Germany, so speaking in English to an audience was tough for her. And she asked me to help her practice. Uh, regarding the NBA, I remember uh, of course uh, covering Magic Johnson, not just through his career, but his HIV announcement. I was one of only three people he spoke to on the day uh, in the wake of him announcing he was HIV positive. I flew out to LA, ended up doing a cover story for Sports Illustrated, and through the years just got to know him and his wife very well. But I remember he was at the Garden one day for a game. This was after he retired. Said he wanted to speak to me at halftime. And so we found a room. We actually ended up in the New York Rangers hockey locker room because it was empty. And he just wanted to tell me that he was going to ask Cookie to marry him. Because this was after the storm of, of HIV. And of course, people were saying that Cookie I uh, should not marry him because of all the things that had happened. But he just wanted to let me know that he was going to ask Cookie to marry him because she had been loyal to him, that he had been with her, and that he realized he loved her. So it's moments like that that I remember having access to the humanities, to the hu human side of some of these athletes that I remember more so uh, than even the great moments on the court. That, that's heartwarming. That really is. That's something that you remember. I know we had talked before and you said, you know, I've forgotten some of the articles I've written and some of the things that I wrote, but you can't forget something like that. And yeah, you, you don't forget those moments. Uh, being on a plane with Patrick Ewing, Patrick Ewing didn't like to speak and didn't like to give interviews. He was going to Jamaica and I was going to follow him until I got an interview and I literally got the seat behind him and like a little kid kept hitting the seat behind him until he finally <laughs> turned around and spoke to me before we before we landed. So yeah, those but it are worked, the things. You, obviously, every, every journalist has those kinds of experiences, and those are the things you remember. 
that is uh that's really that's that's really cool memory to have and uh something that i've got to ask you before i let you go is something i thought was very funny that you mentioned in your column um and again i know that through your career you worked at the new york times you worked at sports illustrated and fortune um and this was all kind of during the era where michael jordan reigned but one thing that i thought was very funny was about a sports illustrated story that was written about Michael Jordan's stunt as a Birmingham Barons player. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that story and uh, what the result was from that story? Well, it's funny that you refer to it as a stunt because many people did view it that way. Um, to give that some context, uh, people remember that Michael Jordan's father had been murdered and he went through a lot of emotions. Uh, he was, there was obviously a lot of pressure on him as an NBA player. And when I look back on it, it seemed to me that he just really needed a break, that he really needed to step away. And his father's passion was baseball, not basketball. And so, as he said, in honor of his father, he was going to make an effort to try to play baseball. Clearly, he is a great, was a great athlete and was able to step into a professional sport at a level that most of us couldn't even think about. It was unrealistic to think he would ever make the major leagues. But many people considered because he didn't and because he uh, got up, he struck out 140 plus times that he was a failure. The editor of Sports Illustrated at the time, uh, Mark Movoy, wanted to do a story on Michael's year in Birmingham and sent Steve Wolf, one of our great writers down here. And Wolf, Steve wrote a very fair and balanced story. But Mark wanted to make a statement on the cover and he called it you know, he said, bag it, Michael. Uh, he said, Michael Jordan and the White Sox are embarrassing baseball. Now, I personally thought that was one of the most embarrassing covers that we ever did. I was there at the time. Many of us spoke up against it, but the editor decided to do it. Not surprisingly, Michael was incensed. And Michael is pretty myopic when it comes to certain things. When he feels something, he is going to stick with it. And he decided at that moment, he was not going to speak to Sports Illustrated again. A few years later, Jack McCallum, a great NBA writer for the magazine, and a person that Michael likes, tried to get them to, to, to broker the peace, to, to cool this off, and Michael just looked at him and said, it's not personal, but I'm never talking to SI again, and I would pretty much guarantee you that Michael Jordan has not spoken to anybody from Sports Illustrated since that, since that cover came out. I, uh, I I told you before that we talked that, you know, I respect that. I think that that, you know, he's, he's holding his guns. And I definitely, for the record, I am a huge baseball fan. I'm a huge Barons fan. I 100% support that year and that season of him being a Baron. Uh, I am all in on that. And, and the uh, way I characterize it is that he tried. You know, failure is when you fail to try. Failure is, is not when you don't succeed. So the point of that year for me is that here's someone who risked his reputation to put himself out there publicly in a sport that he was not trained to perform in and made it to the, to double A, actually got some hits, didn't totally embarrass himself, but he tried. So what I try to impart to young people is always try. You may not succeed, but you're never gonna succeed if you don't try. So I look at that as not, that it was not a failure. His only failure would have been if he had not tried at all. And amen to that, Roy. I think that, you know, one thing, if you are from Birmingham and you grow up and you are reminded and you are told that Michael Jordan was a Baron, nobody says anything about the record of that year. Nobody says anything about the, the hits or the misses or the, the wins or losses. People just say he was a Baron, and that's something that we are proud of, or at least I am proud of. And... Um, like you said, it doesn't matter that uh, the record there, he did it. And uh, God knows it's it's farther than I would get. Um, Roy, I, I love that piece of advice you have. What advice do you maybe have for young journalists who are getting into this field and they see your success, they hear about your career and all of the legends you've covered and all the places you've been? What is your piece of advice for those young journalists? Well, for being part of the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, I've often been able to share thoughts and stories and wisdom uh, with young people coming up. I love doing it as, as some of my peers do. And one of the things I often tell them is, is A, pursue excellence. Uh, never give up trying to pursue the truth, trying to be a better writer, trying to be a re better videographer, trying to be a better storyteller. Uh, that we are responsible for sharing the story of our subjects with the public. So take that 
don't take that for granted. So excellence, integrity, and perseverance. The road I've been on has been long. Uh, it has not been all highs. Uh, I've shared very publicly with people that if you've been in journalism for the last 30 years, you've hit some, some roadblocks. I've been laid off three times uh, in eight years. So you, you know, I had to make some pivots and moves, but I always pursued and respected my craft and believed in my craft and figured that as long as I pursued excellence and integrity and perseverance, I would have an opportunity to share that with someone on some platform. Uh, the, the industry has changed quite a bit since I came in in 1979, but it's great to still be here. It's great to be able to do things like this and share stories and share part of the journey with people who perhaps can uh, enjoy for a few minutes, maybe be inspired to, to tell the story, tell their own stories uh, in their own way. That's great advice, Roy. And we are, um, I'm, I'm lucky to work with you. We're lucky to have you here at AL.com. And uh, we'll end on that note. It's too positive not to. So thank you so much, Roy. Uh, if you haven't caught The Last Dance, you can catch it on Sunday nights on ESPN, Mondays on your streaming services that are connected with ESPN. Um, Michael Jordan, if you're watching, call me. I, <laughs> I will have you on my show any day. And Roy, thank you so much. And uh, for the rest of you, we will see you tomorrow. Thank you, Ivana. Pleasure working with you as well.